Okay, so I want to do a quick video going over a new type of instruction. And this one's not really going to be a native instruction to the hack assembly language, but it's something that the assembler will have as an extension for ease of use for developers to create new programs. So let's go and talk about that real quick. All right. So what we've gone over so far is a baseline set of instructions for the hack assembly language. Those are the A and C instructions we've been talking about, and they're perfectly serviceable in terms of creating programs. However, they do fall short in terms of human readability, convenience, and genuine understanding of what's actually going on in our code. So we can add abstraction to the instruction set by utilizing what's known as symbolic notation. And we can achieve this by adding functionality to our assembler. Now, what is the assembler? Well, it's a program that converts assembly instructions to binary machine code. Minimum, they should have the capability to translate all of the bare minimum amount of instructions to machine code. So all the things we've gone over so far, the A instructions, the C instructions, those all get translated to binary eventually. That'll be the next video that we go over to kind of illustrate what's happening there. And all that binary will be sent into the computer and will eventually traverse to the appropriate components that will handle that data. So the assembler's goal is to take the programs that we, the developers, will write, assemble that from that instruction set into actual raw binary machine code, and then send that to the computer. So since it is a program in itself, we can add as much functionality and extension as we want. So that's what we're gonna do. So let's talk about symbolic programming is the idea of utilizing human readable symbols in conjunction with a particular language's syntax. So for assembly, this is incredible because at minimum, we don't really have a lot of symbols or words or anything so far. For hack, we have basically just the A, D, M registers. We have stuff like at 19, uh, D, G, L, T, all this good stuff. There's no real rhyme or reason for what's happening because I don't know what 19 is, it's just assume it's some location in ROM. But it's not constant what that location would be, so having something that's a bit more of an anchor, something readable, would be really nice. And that's what we're going to be discussing, is how to achieve that. So, we're going to have two forms of symbols, and it's going to be variables, and labels They're very similar but it serves two very different purposes let's talk about variables first so used as a means to create shorthand methods to access particular data stored in memory so it's going to be associated with something in ram idea is a similar assigns a variable to a specific register in memory and uses that location when referencing the variable throughout the program so for our particular assembly language, we're going to have two different forms. One's going to be predefined and one's going to be user defined. So the predefined variables, they're already associated with some location by the assembler. It's built in. We don't have to define these. Sorry, no. So you're going to see R0 through R15 a good bit. They're the first 16 registers, and basically just means register 0, register 1, register 2, etc., etc. It's register 15 and they just correspond to the actual constant values. So there's no difference between doing at zero, R0, so on and so forth. They're the same thing. Um, these is a stack pointer, a local argument, or a local, local pointer, argument pointer, and then there's this and that pointer. So they're, they're pointers, they're not going to be super relevant right now. We'll get to those in later chapters. However, the screen and keyboard are gonna be two that we'll get to eventually later this chapter. So keep these values of 16,384, 24,576 in mind because we will come back to this eventually. For now, 
it's just going to be these. They're pretty basic. So, let's take a look at some code here. So we did this previously, this uh, R0 plus R1 plus 17, but we had stuff like at zero, and at one, at two, and it's it's fine to do this, there's no big deal. Um, it's perfectly serviceable. Let's take a look over here at RAM. Let's uh, load some data into R0 real quick. Let's do four, and then let's do two for R1. Uh, R2, let's just be empty. Let's load some data in. So R0 is gonna be four, R1 is gonna be two, and then we want to figure out what this is. So, yes, we can do at zero, like we did previously. However, we know that this is actually going to be referencing a register, so we just use R0 to say, hey, this is register zero. It's something that I know is important, so I'm going to associate some symbol with it. So all we do is at R0 with equals M, and we grab that value. I'm just going to do ADM again, like I usually do. At R0, this will translate to zero. M is now four. Equals M to four. R1, that's going to translate to 1, M is now 2, D equals D plus M, that's going to be 6, at 17, uh, there's nothing here, like this is unknown, but uh, we don't care about that memory location, we care about the constant values, D equals D plus A, so 6 plus 17, 23, at R2 will translate to 2. Still don't know what that is, but then we do M equals D. We just put that 23 right here, and all of a sudden, measure 2 has 23 stored in it. That's kind of how the predefined variable works. They're not too bad. Uh, they're going to have different use cases, obviously. So that stack pointer, local pointer, all that stuff, along with screen and keyboard, they're very special variables their association is very specific to the hack computer especially screen and keyboard more on that in a future video but let's go and move on so user defined so these are will allow us to create a great deal of flexibility very similar to how like high level languages like python and c plus plus and c sharp or java or something like that utilize variables so instead of directly accessing memory via numerical addresses, we can instead create or initiate some variable. The assembler will then allocate that variable with a particular memory address, and we don't have to do the idea of a at 20 for a particular place in memory. So, user bond variables are allocated to memory beginning at RAM 16. That is because R0 through R15 are the first 15. So whenever we start doing this, we will start doing stuff like maybe I want the classic for loop I. So do at I. So since this is the first variable in maybe my procedure that's come across, the assembler is going to look at this and say, hey, this is a variable. I haven't seen a variable before. This is the first instance of it. So we're going to say that this is going to translate to 16. So we associate and allocate i to register 16. Now maybe we have a, and we're doing a vector or something like that. We have i, j, k. So j will then be the next one. So it'll be 17. And then k will be the next one. So it'll be 18. Every time it comes across a new variable, like so, it will then associate with the next iterated number. Now, it has to be unique. I'll explain what that is momentarily. But, syntax here, this is uh, an A instruction. So we're doing at. So, at const is what we've been doing previously. Loads in 19 to A. Because that's what we want. We have the value 19. We went with the RAM address 19. Now we have at sim with a symbol. So they have x. So for example, if x is bound to 21, 
this instruction will set A to 21. So if we look at it, maybe we had I, J, A, uh, Y, and X. So it should be it was 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, uh, Y, X, 20, 21, something like this. These are all the locations in memory where these variables are associated with. And this is just a very arbitrary example, but this is how you'd have to have X bound to 21. You'd have to have things bound earlier on. So just keep that in mind. It always starts at 16 and continues on from there. So, make sure I didn't skip anything. I did not. There we have the constant values, symbols now. So we have new types of A instructions, and basic C instructions down here, not a big deal. But we have four examples over here. So we have sum equals zero. Well, we know that this can be someplace in memory, so let's just create our variable. That's sum. And we just want to set the memory there to zero. So we do m equals zero. This would be the same thing as at 16, m equals zero. But now it's associated with a more readable name, sum. And this could also change. Maybe we want to create uh, x and y as variables first and then have sum. Well, then sum would also be translated from 16 here to 18. And maybe we want to have a z. z is now 18 and sum is 19. But our code doesn't change. It's always just at sum and the assembler will handle the rest for us. So not a big deal. Let's just write this in at sum m equals zero. And here we have x equals 512. Um, let's think. I know I want the value 512. I'll do d equals a since it's a constant value. And then I'll create my variable x. And then I will do m equals d. So I get the constant value 512 and a, move it from a to d, get at x, which will translate to 16, and then m equals d. Yeah, seems about right. Uh, 512 equals a at x m equals d okay so n equals n minus one this is pretty easy uh, at n i'm just going to create the variable and then we'll just do m equals m minus one because it's decrementing the value of n so we just initialize the variable and then decorate the decrement the memory and then sum equals sum plus x um how do i approach this I think that would be along the lines of x here. Once your d equals m, you grab the value of it. We have to sum, since we're doing sum in computation and the destination, we can just do m equals m plus d. Like so, and that should be about it. Uh, they do theirs a little bit differently. They go to sum first then x, and then move back to sum. So both both methods are, are fine. The one that I did is more optimal by two cycles, essentially. So if performance is critical, you'd want to use what I wrote as opposed to what you see here. The goal will be the same, but one six lines, one's four lines, it's a very small change. Unless you put this in like a loop or something, it won't matter too much. So, moving from there, we have the idea of labels. So previously, we've been branching directly to line numbers, which for what we've been doing has been kind of okay, since we've seen where the lines are, and we know what to associate with, it's okay, but if we start actually writing more custom code and particular procedures, then maybe we write some code like this, 
and I want to jump here to this line, right? Well, then what happens is we go to maybe uh, line 12. What happens if I start writing a line beforehand? I just wrote two lines. The 12 is not going to be here anymore. It's going to be here. I would need to change this to line 14 to get it to point to the original location. So I have to go in and change every place. That it jumps to. That's not okay. So we use labels. As it is incredibly flexible and also very readable. So let's explain that. This right here. And right here. Or what labels are. So, label sim is declared using parentheses and then the actual name of the symbol. Any label sim declared somewhere in the program can appear in a at sim very similar to our variables it is an a instruction but instead of being associated with 16 17 18 19 so on and so forth the assembler resolves labels to the actual address in raw so it will do a loop through all the code and figure out where those labels are stored and associated so in the previous example we had some code and i said hey i want to jump to like line 12 or something no, I had at 12 specifically, and that's, it works, this is, this is 12 here, well now I can do, maybe I'm jumping to loop or something, well it's, it's just here, <laughs> right, so just here, and instead of doing 12, I do at here, the yeah, assembler would go through and read that, hey, this is line 12. So here would translate to 12. And then maybe I can write some code here. Well, now it's line 14. So the assembler read through and then look, it's like, hey, this isn't 12, it's 14. So by doing this, we don't have to be cognizant of where our labels are, what line number they are. The assembler will handle that for us. So it makes life significantly easier than knowing a particular line number, making sure you adjust all the jumps to that particular line number when you add and remove code. The assembler knows where it is without fail, so it saves a lot of heartache in that way. And then here we have some pretty decent examples of non-symbolic. What we did before, we just had go to 48. So line jumps to like straight up line 48, which we have no idea what 48 is. We just know that it's a line number in our code and it should jump to it. Same thing here, 21, jump to line 21 in a conditional branch. And then here we do some math and whatnot and jump to line 35. This is all valid code. It will work, but we might not have any idea really what's going on if we have to self-tell somebody else. They read 48, 21, 35. You would do a look for that particular address and figure out what's going on. Whereas with labels, if loop, well, we know by default, just by reading this, we have some loop. The assembler knows where it is. We don't have to actually adjust it. Here we have continue. And that probably means it's breaking out of a loop or something like that. Tell just by reading it, doing something. And here we can say that x is less than zero. Go to neg, well that just means it's negative. So we can actually discern what our branches are, what's happening, why we're jumping to these places. The assembler knows where these places are, so we don't have to memorize line numbers. We can just let the assembler do its job. And then also, just as a note, particular on this one, by convention, not by design, not strictly by design, but just by best practice or hack. The variables should be a lowercase symbol like this X and the labels should be an uppercase symbol. Now, this isn't required, but it does make reading the actual code significantly easier. And that's pretty much all that there is for symbolic programming, at least for now. These are the two built-in to hack abstractions that they've added. And they're really nice, honestly. They add a lot of functionality, they add a lot of flexibility, and save a lot of time and 
I chose a good way where even though this isn't actually being directly translated to the computer, it's sometimes being translated by the assembler, adjusted to what the actual instruction code is, and then being converted. It takes a bit more time and processing power to do that, but it adds enough flexibility to where it's just actually an incredible boon to development time. So you might test a little bit more processing time, but in terms of the turnaround on development time, absolutely amazing. But the hack of single language is very rudimentary at best. You go to more industry-based stuff, you have a lot more flexibility generally. But we're going to eventually add more abstraction, but that's gonna be in a few chapters. For now, labels and variables are what you got. And honestly, again, they're not too bad. So, a lot being said, hope this was educational. Hope you learned something. Particularly, I hope all this makes sense. And I'll see you in the next video.